Welcome, everybody. It is Talk Back, brought to you by Silway Armory on Stockyard Road with more guns and ammo than anyone. Missoula, Montana's premier firearms dealer, Ponderosa Dental, proud corporate partner of Grizzly Athletics. When you think of a great smile, think of Ponderosa Dental. Also brought to you by Western States Cap on reserves, some things you may need for winter season like deals on batteries and antifreeze. And by Missoula Nissan Hyundai. If you're considering a new or pre-owned vehicle, head directly to Missoula Nissan Hyundai. Every purchase gets two years of free service and one full year of free gas. They are Missoula's truck capital. And we have a new sponsor, a new sponsor. as go, of this morning. Go, John, go. Uh, Big Sky Breakout is sponsoring Talk Back Now, and I'm really excited about this one. We found out about Big Sky Breakout when we went as a company for a, kind of a company training session. Cool. And so what Big Sky Breakout is, is you are in a room with a bunch of puzzles to solve, and your job is to get out of the room <laughs> within an hour. <laughs> and. When I had first heard about this, I'm thinking some kind of danky dungeon, right, or something weird like that. But it's it's not. It's really high class. It looks like you're in like a Hollywood movie set or something. In the one that we were in, we were in an Old West uh, prison. And it was all based on a real Montana story about the first person arrested in Missoula and imprisoned, who apparently was able to break out on his own. Now, this guy was a cad. But in the story, you're actually innocent and you're trying to get out, right? So... The uh, the game, though, I was fascinated. When we finished the game and we got out, the thing that was really interesting is we got to see the dynamics of the team, right? So you've got all of these talk show hosts. Um, <laughs> we have an actual boss in the room with us, and we're all in prison. We're trying to find our way out. Right. And different people take on leadership roles that you might not expect. Uh, different people are good at solving different types of puzzles. It was fantastic. Um, anyway, when we got out of the breakout, I immediately went over and said, I need to get you People need to know about this. I want you to be a talkback sponsor. We talked a little bit about it. They decided to do it. I immediately bought Christmas presents for breakouts. My daughter's <laughs> pumped. We're going to go back. I've got like two dates lined up. So cool. Absolutely. If you've ever, if you've ever enjoyed games or puzzles or um, working with other people, uh, this is one of the most interesting things you could do. Take your wife out on a date night or a couple of friends. It's a blast. You'll have a great time. Check out Big Sky Breakout. Uh, you can also check them out online at BigSkyBreakout.com. Okay, here we go. <clears throat> well, that's all the time we have today. I'm sorry we can't get Fred Thomas on. <laughs> good morning, <laughs> good morning, Fred. How are you? It's good. I'm just fine. Are you ready to I break out it. today? Well, I think that we should have the legislature go through that Big Sky Breakout, <laughs> too. I, know, I was wondering. how to work together and... And, uh, you know, create some solutions versus uh, leaving all the puzzles, all, well, pieces all I, over the I, floor. I, I, I have it. I have exactly the way it could work. You're bringing all, okay. all the Senate and the House leadership into a, a, a room that's marked infrastructure. And, and, you, and, you, and, you, and you're trying. The, the thing is, you have to build a dam or a bridge in one hour, or else, you know, you're, you're, you're done. You lose the game. <laughs> there you go. Good job. There you um, go. I, I don't know if you want a bunch of lawyers building a bridge. <laughs> uh, but I, I, I am curious. I think it would be interesting for people to know, Fred. So um, you're, you're going to be the Senate Majority Leader for 2017, if I'm Correct. not mistaken. Tell us a little bit about how that process works. How do the different teams, for lack of a better word, the Republicans and Democrats, come up with their leadership? Well, uh, after the election, then there's meetings that we call caucuses. And, uh, you know, caucus is just a gathering of a group of people. And so they're not a public uh, part of the public infrastructure like a committee or the Senate as a whole. Uh, The Democrats caucus together and Republicans caucus uh, separately, etc., um, in there, and before those meetings take place, there's a lot of uh, jockeying, if you will, to uh, garner votes and put coalition together to come together to get a majority of the votes for a majority leader or whip or a committee on committees. And speaker is working to get reelected as speaker, exactly exa- as an example. Um, so then uh, the process is the oldest guy around or gal, whichever it might be, in this case, uh, myself, the person who has served the most time, I should say, um, uh, then organizes that process, brings the group together, and uh, and and we elect the leadership for the for the next session. Now, is this binding? I mean, when when we have leaders or the different caucuses have leaders, like 
do they have to follow the rules or is it just kind of an inside game as to how we're going to channel power? Well, uh, two things. One is the president and the president pro tem are technically elected by the full Senate. And so while we've elected Scott Sales and Bob Keenan to be the president and president pro tem, uh, they will then, uh, by the, the Republican caucus is going to, in essence, decided to nominate them for president. And, they, and we will do that on the first day of the session. One of the very first things we do is to do that, uh, is formally elect them as president and president pro tem. Um, the caucus leader, like myself and the whips, uh, we're elected solely by our Republican caucus. Mm. And we will then, so we're done. We're we're elected. Now, we have Brad Sheeta coming on later. He is a whip. Uh, but, yes, right. But do, do, I've always I mean, wondered about do, that. Do you term. actually give them a whip? I mean, <laughs> do they get a cat of nine tails or I'd something? I'd love to know where that came from. Well, um, actually, I have Monty's old whip <laughs> from, the, uh, from years back. And so um, I may give it to the whips to use a little bit, but uh, uh, it's very effective. No, the, 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 the title, the, the term is really... Uh, the title is a term, and the idea is to whip, literally in the sense of gathering people together and get them to support uh, what the leadership wants to do, as an example. Is, is there a um, so, T-shirt that says cat herder on it? or um, <laughs> Whip it whip it good, that's what actually the T-shirt says. Yeah, that's that's what the back of my coat says, <laughs> whip, it, whip it good. Um, and I don't know how you came up with that, but you, it's there. Um, uh, but... Uh, so, for an example, though, as majority leader, now and then I'll want to know where is the caucus on a uh, the Republicans on a on a vote on a bill, and so I might ask the whips. I said, I need you to find out right now on the floor: are we good on this bill? Do we have the votes to support it or not? And 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 so this is and this is a to- this is a, a a tactical thing. You're trying to find out if we have the votes to go ahead with a bill that you might yeah. want. Or you yeah, might yeah. want to fail, make sure it fails, that sort of thing. One or the other, that's right. And and then, I mean, they're, they're an integral part of the leadership team that meets and discusses the issues of the day, the issues of the session, and, you know, the caucus has decided they're, they're the people that we want to be having those and in on all those discussions as a group and, and formulating, helping formulate our plan and getting the caucus's work done. And and so they're a key part of the whole picture uh, to me anyway. And I I use them a great deal. I've got three whips: uh, Senators Ed Buttry and Mark Blaisdell and Kerry Smith, and, and they're all extremely capable people. You know, it's interesting that that you would say that because uh, from what I one hard and fast rule I know about attorneys is when you go into court, or in, in this case in the legislature, you never want to enter a situation asking questions when you don't already know what the answer is in advance, right? And so, so you go into the session prepared to know uh, what's going to happen, rather than being surprised when something, you know, it, you know, comes out of nowhere. Yeah, that, that, that's that's kind of a rule, um, but but it's not one of a leadership role uh, rule. And, and what I mean by that is that um, there's lots of times I ask questions fully knowing what the answer is, uh, but I want the, uh, the the data to be brought. To the surface, so instead of saying, "Well, isn't this the case?" you just you ask it in the form of a question, which that was. But but um, because you want this certain things brought to the table, so everybody knows that those facts, and the person presenting can might have missed something, and you want to ask that question to be brought to the table. But often, I mean, after a while, I mean, somebody's got to ask. Don't know the answer to as well. And so, I mean, to me, I don't care if people think, well, God, he doesn't know anything. He's asking these questions. Because many times as citizen legislators, I mean, you get into tax areas, you get into um, <clears throat> workers' compensation areas, you get into all these different things. Somebody's got to answer, ask the questions that they don't know the answer to because, you know, we need to find these things out. So it's an unwritten rule to be careful not to ask a question that you don't know the answer to, but at the same token... Somebody's got to lead and ask questions you don't know the answer to as well. I have a question I know the answer to. Peter, is it time for a break? It is time for a break, John. Oh, my God. You guys are too easy. <laughs> Very lawyerly yeah. done by that, I might Maybe say. Maybe you could serve Look. in the legislature. I object. <laughs>
<laughs> we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna come right. I, I'm gonna stand on my desk and jump up and down. I, I remember that from somewhere. We're gonna come right back with uh, more of talk back. By the way, we have three lines open. If you want to talk to the Senate Majority Leader for the state of Montana for the upcoming legislative session, Fred Thomas. He's on the phone right now. If you have a question or comment, even if he doesn't know the answer, that's okay. We'll be uh, right back. We are shaking our legislative booty at this point, <laughs> if there is such a thing. 721-1290 is our number, 1-800-568-5309. The incredibly hip Fred Thomas, uh, Senate Majority Leader, <laughs> joining us this well morning said. from from his from his well-appointed uh, luxury automobile uh, you know, Carrying him, ferrying him from place to place. So I'm sure. Right uh, ambassador of hipness, I'm sure. <laughs> um, so, Fred, I wanted to shift gears a little bit and talk a little bit about your expectations for the upcoming legislative session. Um, uh, you know, it's kind of reading the pulse of things. It looks like there's already a little bit of a fight brewing over a proposed budget that came out of the governor's office a few weeks ago. Um, can you comment a little bit about that and what it, how it sets the tenor for what's to come? Well, it, sure, I, I, I can, and, and I will. Um, speaking of puzzles and putting puzzles together, it, it's been a very difficult task for our staff to sort out what the proposal was of the governor as a whole, figure out you know what was being done and how, et cetera. I think they've got it figured out now, and, and, and there's a lot of, uh, oh, there's kind of a lot of stuff just thrown together to say, here's a budget, and the goal is still hung up on this $300 million deal, and so a lot of things were just thrown together. So you could end up with an ending fund balance of $300 million, um, at the end of, of the fiscal year 19. Um, and so I'm not trying to be very complimentary when I say that, because it, it makes it very difficult for the legislature then to take that budget and rearrange it and make it work, because many much of it does not. So... Though, as a whole, as a legislature, I can't control what the governor does, obviously. That's up to him, and he's elected by the public, and I respect that. Uh, But as a legislature, I think that what you're going to find in this session is a legislature that's going to work together far more uh, than they have in the past, in the sense that Republicans have good-sized majorities in both houses. And I think that while there's been a, a traditional split for a while in the Republican caucuses, um, where there's been more of a moderate faction and more of a conservative faction, um, I think you're going to find that those two groups uh, work together, uh, you know, significantly better as a whole and and come up with plans that will be good for the state, uh, dealing with the budget, dealing with tax issues, dealing with infrastructure issues, uh, and on down the list, uh, far better than we have in the past. And one of the things that's going to make that happen is that as we've seen our revenue fall in the state uh, this last couple of years, um, with all natural resource-based revenue sources down, um, it it has put the state's deficit or the state's budget in a deficit position. And so uh, the Republicans need to come together to, to deal with this and make and, and fix this situation that we have as best we can. We may not be able to fix the, you know, you know the revenue side because of with natural resources because the governor's still in control of the DEQ and the DNRC and all the apparatus that permits new mines and literally doesn't permit new mines and projects, drags them out, kills them, all that sort of thing. Um, so we may not be able to fix the revenue side. Uh, but we can deal with the spending side and um, come together with a budget that's decent. Uh, spending has gone up under the gov- under uh, uh, Governor Bullock's tenure significantly, and revenue has gone down significantly. So uh, we can deal with it. We can come up with a budget that everybody has to uh, take some haircut on, whether it's our local schools, university system, you know, across the board. Uh, nobody's going to get particularly what they like or want uh, as a in, in the big picture, small picture, or the base picture. It'll be there. I mean, schools st- schools are still going to have good funding, etc. But uh, it's so, just unfortunate that we're in the situation we're in. Well, let, let me ask you this. So, one of the things that's come up. I mean, barely any cuts have been proposed, right? But 
Uh, one thing that has come up is this issue with the Montana Highway Patrol and that they might have to cut officers back. Uh, the Attorney General's office kind of came out and said that it was a bit dangerous. And all of this is referring to some suggested uh, budgeting that came out of the governor's proposed budget. Um, mm-hmm. You know, it, it seems like, you know, cutting is just so much more difficult to do because everybody has that special interest or that that group is going to get a cut and they're going to they're going to protest it. Um, that's it seems to me uh, going to invite a little bit of enmity between the different groups, right? Yeah, um, it, it, yeah, it, cutting the budget is never yeah. fun because, you know, candidly, there's some in the press that wants to focus on stuff that is proposed, like, well, you're going to trim back 5% or something, you know, and what have you. And so that's where the focus is because they want to focus on that. Um, and, and it's presented that way. Um, so if we could, if we could trim the budget all at once and, and start, you know, set the dial back a couple of days, uh, something of that nature would be nice if we could so that all the reductions are done all at once. And then you move forward from there. That'd be a nice outcome and a nice way to deal with it. Tell you what, Fred, we're, we're, we're up against a break, so if you mind sure. hanging on, and we've got two folks who want to visit with you on the phone, Tyler okay. and Marilyn are both waiting, so we're going to get those uh, folks on after this quick timeout. Uh, 721-1290 is our number. This is Talk Back. Our guests, Senate Majority Leader Fred Thomas. Okay. And we are back on Talk Back. 721-1290 is the number. Uh, Fred Thomas joining us, Senate Majority Leader. And let's get right to the phones because we have just a few minutes in this short segment. So uh, this is Tyler. Tyler, you're up first with Fred Thomas. Hi. Hi. Hi, Fred. Good morning. Um, my question to you is uh, VA, VA, VA. How are we going to fix the VA? Well, of course, it's a federal issue. And so... Um, uh, we won't be dealing with it in Helena, uh, unfortunately. If, if, if it were under our uh, authority, we would have fixed this a long time ago. With the new president, I think he's made it clear he intends to address the VA. And I think that the issue that you've got here is very simple, and that's that uh, the President uh, Obama and the Democrats have wanted to protect the unionized VA the way it is, and that patients are secondary to the uh, people that work there. And that's just got to change. And it's, it's not going to take a lot to make it a lot so, so significantly better, but it's a complete mind shift in who's the priority Thanks, Tyler. Uh, to the VA. All right, let's get one more call in here. We have about two and a half minutes. Marilyn, what's on your mind? Good morning. Okay, I listened to a late-night talk show, John Batchelor is the host, and he had a fellow on, I think it was somebody from the Hoover Institute, and they were talking about an article that Gruber, the fellow that wrote, uh, was, you know, part writer of, mm-hmm. you know. He was the originator of Obamacare. Yeah, so on October 27th, this guy writes this article, and he exposes the fact um, <laughs> of some illegal aspects of Obamacare, and um, the gist of it was that I took a few notes on was that um, the 20 million that they keep touting of all these people that got on Obamacare, a lot of them, most of them were from Medicaid expansion, and mm-hmm. um, and there is going to be money owed back to the feds from the states, and that it was certain insurance companies that made out on this one. And so at the end, they said, so... This was a, so Obamacare was a scam, and I wrote in my notes, oh, newsflash, Obamacare was a scam. <laughs> so, um, so really, yeah, I mean, real, I, real, I'm mad uh, at the rhinos in Montana that signed on to this thing, but I know they were really pressured by the Democrats. Do you, do you, so, have, a, do you have a question, because we're running out of time? Yeah, so do you know about this, that there's going to be a whole bunch of money that's going to be having to go back from our state to the feds? Okay, thanks, Marlon. So what do you think, Fred? Uh, and, and I don't think, from what I know, that's not going to be the case that the state will send back money uh, that we uh, have received or will receive uh, due to the Medicaid expansion that we've uh, had in Montana. Um, uh, but that's not to say that uh, that just may be a difference of what we're talking about here, because I think that the insurance companies probably owe money back, um, and, and people may owe money back that, that didn't qualify or they got a subsidy on the exchange that they didn't qualify for, and that thing was so poorly done and, and set up that, uh, that, that there's too many.
many surprises that people will have. It's just hard to say. It depends. But uh, certainly the Unaffordable Care Act is going to get <laughs> undone. It's not sustainable uh, because of the obvious reason. It was bad design from the start. We and, and they were all told that from the very beginning. This isn't news that this was a bad design and it's going to lead to, to hardships for many people. Now, um, and it is. Now, Fred, one thing that I think Marilyn might be referring to is that uh, the states are going to pick up a little bit larger percentage of the yeah. share of year, the cost of year. insuring those yeah. that are on the expansion, uh, taking up their own Medicaid rules. Uh, that's obviously an expense that uh, hopefully we forecasted for here in the state of Montana. If the Affordable Care Act does go by the wayside, Montana's going to have to figure out how to deal with that extra population that now has insurance. It's not going to be so easy to walk over and say, I'm taking it away. Well, the, true enough. Uh, uh, but but the fact is, is that if you're an able-bodied individual, that's between the ages of like 20 and 60. Um, you've got the ability to, uh, frankly, get out, work more hours, and, and raise your standard of living so you might qualify for a, a future, a current subsidy on the exchange and, with and that, or and with that, Fred, a future. Yeah, mm-hmm. we are completely out of time for this segment, so stay with us. I know you promised to stay with us for the top of the hour. We'll be right back. Okay, it's uh, Peter and John and Fred plus one. We have also have Nate McConnell joining us in the studio. How are you, Nate? Good this morning, Peter. Thank you. Welcome to our show. I appreciate being he, here. He's dressed much nicer than John. Around. Oh yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Let it be. I noted forgot that... to tell him it wasn't a TV show. <laughs> <laughs> T-shirts are welcome in the studio. Thanks, straight, man. Remember, and, yeah. and floppy-eared pajama bottoms. <laughs> um, so, Nate, tell us a little bit about yourself. What's your role in the legislature? Uh, well, uh, I'm uh, going into my second term. Um, I'm a Democrat from House District 89 here in Missoula. Which um, is where? Which exactly? is the university district. Um, up That's Pat- why he's dressed so Pat- <laughs> Yeah, I don't live there, trust me. Um, up Patty Canyon all the way upper Miller Creek down to the Ravalli County line. Um, I like to I like to brag and to people who don't know me that I represent three of the best fishing streams in the, in the state. There you uh, go. Bitterroot. Clark Fork and Rock Creek. Well, there you go. Hey, I do have a question for you. It's uh, pertinent to your district. So one of the things I thought was really interesting about the changeup at the University of Montana is that it's occurring right before the legislative session, which happens only every two years, and that it seems to me that the lack of a president in a year like that would make it difficult for the university to lobby for its interests in a kind of honed-in way. Um, How do you plan on making sure that the university is properly represented during the legislative session at your district? I mean, obviously, that's got to be an important, crucial part of your district's life's lifeblood, I would assume. Well, um, yeah, the University of Montana is is vital to not just my district, but the entire city, the entire county, the entire region. Um, I I want to personally thank Royce Engstrom. Um, He's done an amazing job as president. People above my pay grade felt it was time for him to move on, and he felt so himself. Um, the people should know that we've been um, – the delegation here in Missoula has been meeting with Royce and, and other leaders and among ourselves just to sort of develop a plan. These plans don't just come out when the session starts. Um, there's a lot of um, – the governor has a plan. The Republicans have a plan. The Democrats have a plan. So um, we're, we're working very hard to ensure that Mon- University of Montana is – Is there is, anything specific you can share with us? I mean just to, that you've been talking about in preparatory uh, for the – And session. does it include water slides? <laughs> <laughs> only only for the good people of HD89. Yeah. Uh, no. The, 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 just the general budget, um, I'm sure Senator Thomas has, has discussed this earlier – um, budget budgets are going to be tight, and mm-hmm. so we have to be really smart about where we put our investments. Um, we're certainly advocating the Missoula delegation, certainly advocating for uh, appropriate funding for the university, um, and we're going to do our best to make sure that happens. Now, now, please uh, tell me if I'm wrong here, but but in my conversations with uh, Clay Christian and uh, and Kevin McRae, uh, the way it was explained to me is the legislature uh, devotes uh, what, what he called a big wheelbarrow full of money for the university system, okay? And that, and here's the wall, and on the other side is the Board of Regents. And they dump that over to the Board of Regents and say, okay, here's your money, go spend it. So does the legislature really have any power to delineate where that money goes once it's in the Board of Regents' hands? The the You're exactly right. That's, that's the – Senator Tom Facey says you – Put a bag full of money and then you throw it over, and he's and he's right. Uh, by law, the the legislature doesn't get get to control, 
you know, A, B, C in the line items in the budget for the university system. Um, so we we do that. That's generally correct. But there are exceptions for like infrastructure things like that, right? That is that is true. And full disclosure, I am not on appropriations, okay. so I'm not I'm, I'm not exactly sure how the uh, I'm not into the minutia of that how that happens. But you're right. There are certain infrastructure type projects that, like Romney Hall, is going to be on the that was on the list last time. Um, I know the Missoula College was uh, devoted had had dedicated funds uh, in the session before I started. So, so um, since we got both of you on here, um, and I'm sure we'll get more stories later uh, mm-hmm. off air. We've already started a little <laughs> bit, but um, uh, I wanted to hear a little bit from both of you about maybe the difference in the Republicans and the Democrats when they're approaching some of the the the, the decreased amount of funding this year. Where do you think? cuts are likely to occur or where would you try to promote that they occur and how do you how do we best do that without harming uh you know the, the things that we all enjoy here in montana we'll start with you nate what do you think? well first of all let me say that um my personal relationships with republicans is very strong i i enjoy most of their companies senator thomas included um he's a good guy he has you know he he's advocating what he thinks is best for our state and I certainly respect that. Um, the way we approach it is, you know, 2015 was my first session. And so in between that time and now, um, Governor Bullock was reelected. Um, he was reelected. Certainly. Uh, it was a bruising campaign. It was a bruising campaign, yeah. but he, he won. He won by four points. That's a that's a pretty good win for for a Democrat. Um, the people want him back. Um, his budget, I think, in 2015 was a solid one. Um we certainly the budget <clears throat> estimates are below what what we had hoped, but um, I think his budget is nimble enough to address some of the issues that that are ahead of us. Um, so, when it, what about you, Fred? Obviously, we've already talked. You disagree with the governor's budget, so yeah, yeah. Well, the, the thing that we're, I think we're going to probably look at doing is is uh, cross the board cuts in the sense that uh, we look at where the budget was gone up so much under Governor Bullock's tenure. It's gone up 20-some percent in the last four years. So we're going to look at those increases to pair them back, just for obvious reasons, because it's, it's gone up so much. Unless it was really direly needed, uh, let's look at those spots that have gone up so much. Uh, the worst-case scenario that we've got is that uh, students' tuition at the university system is probably not going to be able to stay frozen, um, and, that, and that our local schools, our K-12 schools, are probably not going to uh, get a generous increase as they have in the past, um, just because they're part of the program. I mean, you know, they're going to have to take some uh, uh, reduction as well, or well, no, what Fred, would have been there in it, the future. Isn't it so much easier? We need to take a break here, but uh, you've got both of you guys to think about this question. Isn't it just easier right up front to tell every agency in the state, say, look, Everybody's going to take an X percent cut. Everybody. I don't care where it is. Yeah. I mean, it's going to be evil. It's going to be across the board. It's not going to be – there will be no favorites here. And and that way, uh, everybody can cry on their beer, and, uh, it, and and they can commiserate together. So John would say that's easier, but it's dumber. Okay. All right. Well, because some organizations operate more effectively. Peter, if I were to say, hey, Peter, everybody in Town Square Media is getting a cut, even though you work twice as hard as them. Is that fair? Does it benefit the company? No and no. I think that that's the same problem when you come with a statewide program like that. Some organizations are w- operating at full efficiency or har- more than 90%. Others are at 40% or 30%. you got to look at where the cuts are and do a precise cut. Well, we'll, we'll talk to our, our representatives and see how they feel about it in a moment. Oh. Okay, we're back. This is Talk Back. 721-1290 is our number. 1-800-568-530. Now, we're just getting into the whole conversation about... What we're going to do about the fact that we have less money coming in. John and I seem to disagree. Well, yeah, we we disagreed fundamentally on the best way to do cuts. Peter was proposing an across-the-board cut. I think that that would lead to inefficiencies. Well, What, it, what about it, you, it, legislators, well, on, since we don't it, have it, any... Let, uh, let me just respond to you a little bit. Yeah, it, it, okay. in, in my view, what you're proposing is the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. And the, So how do things get better with that? Well, we're not talking about cuts to personal paychecks. We're talking no, we're, about we're organizational talking about programs, cuts. exactly. Sure. Are all programs created equal? Yes or no? You can answer this. Are they all benefiting benefiting Montana in the same amount? 
Probably not. Okay, then there is obviously a sense of unfairness in the distribution of goods here, right? So you don't want to just go across the board and cut everything since not everything is doing equal good. But but what you're still saying is the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. No, and I actually so, never so, said so that. The, you said that twice. Well, I know that, but that that is, that is the inference I hear from your argument. No, I saying yeah, here's well, what I'm here, saying. Bad here's, orders, here's a program that's not performing very well. Sure. Let's cut their budget. Here, here's a here's a program who or, or here, let's re- increase their budget. Here's a program that's performing very well. Let's let's decrease their budget, and and everybody has a, ex- exactly the same cut. I'll make it even more complicated. All right. Some programs are performing at their peak efficiency, but the programs aren't that great to begin with the whole idea of them and they should be cut so so well, there's there's, so there's who gets to make there? that decision the John? legislature okay. which is why we have these ombres so i'm going to shut up now <laughs> i'm, I'm going to be quiet now well in in, in I'll get the corner. with the governor so so nate and fred obviously we had this little back and forth here um i assume you probably will have or have had some of these similar conversations in the legislature yourselves do you have a take on what peter and i were saying you, you yes, start fred go ahead um so look at it it's a combination of of those two because you have the you know the, there are three big sections of government that we spend money on uh, and that's our K12 education system for schools our local schools university system and then human services to people that are blind disabled low income seniors etc and so those are the three big areas less than maybe fourth is general government that's in hell on it uh, but you you have to take if Depending on our final revenue estimates and the budget that we're going to try and accomplish, um, you have to take reductions everywhere. You can't just take it out of the university hide completely, for example, or the school system. You, you have to spread them across the board. But then, as you say, you have to look at individual programs. And, for example, um, you know, are, would you want to take an across-the-board cut and trim back on what we spend on able-bodied people in the Medicaid expansion program? It's like, no. They, they can, we can cut tons of people out there, for example. I would rather vote to cut those, uh, people out there than people that are in a wheelchair. They, they don't have any option of what they're going to do. And so that's where you have to pinpoint and look at, you know, how, what are we really doing here and are we going to be fair about it? Everybody gets a reduction, but you've got to then pinpoint and look and, and make the, the right cuts in the right places. For example, this idea that you would cut the, you know, the high patrol way down. I mean, it's kind of like, where did that come from? Mars? Well, um, Governor what Bullock's a, what a bad budget idea. actually is where it came from. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, I guess that's uh, why I guess either way you say it. Well, um, but but what a bad idea to cut the law enforcement force down that, that, that's uh, designed to create public safety on our highways. Well, well, Nate, let, let's, get, let's get Nate's view. What do you think, Nate? Well, I, I, I kind of agree with uh, John. Um, I don't think all programs, I don't think all um, government agencies are created equal. I think some are much more important than others. Um, and I think, you know, the the great debate that we're going to have coming up is, you know, it, what are we going to do with a more limited pie, right? Mm-hmm. Um, are we going to are we going to strengthen our investments in education? Are we going to strengthen our investments in infrastructure? Are we going to are we going to try to make the the average Montana's lives a little bit better. Now, when you say strengthen, I'm under the assumption that we're going to just be good to hold even. Yeah, that's right. That's right. But but in 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 the sense that, you know, Vice President Biden says, "Don't don't tell me your values. Show me your budget." Right? Like that. That is a reflection of our values. And and you know, uh, Senator Thomas and I um, might disagree on on something like the rainy day fund. Hmm. I think the rainy day fund in the 2015 budget was vital to keeping Montana afloat. And I think we should do it again. Um, I, there, there are things like that, that that are sort of outside of this, you know, are all agencies going to be cut the same? Um, some agencies are more important than others. Um, some programs are more effective than others. Um, but we have to look at this as a whole as well. Let's talk a little bit about the not so rainy day fund, also known as the fire suppression fund. Um, uh, the governor has proposed digging into that. And a lot of people are like, well, you know, it's not that bad of a fire season, but what if it is a really bad fire season? That, I mean, that sort of thinking is the, it, it, it's troublesome if the year goes bad, right? It's kind of a bet. Yeah, I, you know, to be honest with you, John, I don't have um, a good read on how much do you, Fred or 
Peter, do you guys have an idea of how much he's what his proposal is? I believe it's twenty five million dollars is what he wants to take out of the or, 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 or he wants to have a three hundred million dollar rainy day fund yes. when, when all is said and done. I believe twenty five million is is coming out of the fire suppression fund. Is that correct, Fred? Yeah, I mean the number could be different, but you know this idea that you have the fire suppression fund is kind of like you know it's six half a dozen the other, and that's it. We're we're going to pay the bills for fighting and suppressing fire in Montana next year. And the next year after that, regardless of whether we have the money put aside in a, an account or not. And so um, if you pull money out of there to balance the current budget and make it look better, then you're saying the idea of a rainy day fund for a fire suppression isn't a very good idea. If you leave the money alone and, and, and leave it over there, then it is. I mean, and we bleed off excess money anyway when it hits a certain level. We take money out of there anyway or don't divert it there. And so... You know, it's it, 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 it. What's important is that six. It, it's six and a half a dozen because we're going to pay those bills to fight fires in Montana, Montana uh, uh, forest lands, and that's just the bottom line. Whether it's in a, in this fund or not. Mm. All right. So with, with that, we're up against a break, and we have Travis on the line and two lines open. If you want, this is a great conversation. So let's converse. Uh, we have two lines open. Seven two one twelve ninety. We could solve all the legislature's problems before two thousand seventeen <laughs> even begins. We're we're well on our way. <laughs> we'll be right back. Stay with us. All of a sudden, I feel really hungry. I seven two one twelve ninety is our number one eight hundred five six eight five three zero nine. Joining us on the phone, Senate Majority Leader Fred Thomas. We've got Nate McConnell uh, joining us here in the studio. And a uh, quick Facebook question, and then we'll go to phones. Okay. Uh, Paul wants to know: Will the topic of deleting emails by the former Attorney General, now Governor, be brought up in session for the people of Montana? Um, I might jump on that real quick because I think we'll have a set. A set of bills that will deal with all kinds of de- areas of of protecting state uh, property, such as emails, and 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 looking into the whistleblowing issues that have been raised in the past few months. Okay. okay. All right. Good. Let's get to the phone. And uh, Travis, you are on with Fred and Nate. Go ahead. Good morning. Um, if you were to take the Montana budget, knock off a bunch of zeros, and make it more like what the average Montanans' income is and their expenses, how difficult is it? I, I just I have a hard time understanding how hard it is to balance a budget if the husband of the household wants the big screen TV, but the wife says it's too expensive, get rid of cable. You know, you have to come to terms with what's important, what's not important. You know, there's, there's a concept of a zero-based budget. I don't see how hard it would be to look at your budget from a perspective of if we did without this, would we be just fine? Some people might do without, but I'm sure they'll live. I, I just it, it, It's from the national level to the local level to the state level. Well, there's one to balance one. the budget is, 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 is a, too much of a challenge. They, they complicate it too much. Well, um, there is one huge complication that most people don't have to deal with unless you're in a really radical sales environment, and that is to make the, balance, the budget balance, they have to do an accurate revenue forecast for the entire state. For two years. For two years. They have to know yeah. how much money every industry is going to make, and in a state that has uh, natural uh, resource-heavy, you know, when we have a huge boom in that, it's hard to expect. When we have a huge decline in that, it's hard to expect. So you don't even know how much money you're really working with uh, to start with, which can make things a lot more difficult than a family budget. Let, let's go ahead and let our, our legislators answer that question. So, Nate, you first. Yeah, if I could hop in. Um, Travis, it's almost like you're clairvoyant. Um, <laughs> I, we, had to, we had to get rid of cable in my house. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, no! And and that's and that's because we have we have two kids in daycare and and even though both Jamie and I work, um, we understand what it's like to be an average Montanan like you. And so um, one thing I would point out, I'd agree with John that it it is a little tricky when you're when you're a state and you're a government to to predict, especially in a biennium system that we have, to predict how much money you're going to have. So we don't really know. I mean, we have really good people who forecast. We have really good people who um, work on these budget issues. Um, but it, it, sometimes it gets tricky. You don't know when the Bakken is going to play out. You don't know when, you know, certain, a new technology might come in and, and, uh, 
be an innovator and, and create jobs in our state. I mean, that's the big thing that set us back this last uh, biennium is right. that the revenue estimate was way off. It yeah. was, you know, in, in in a sense, it was off by one one percent. I mean, it, it it wasn't it wasn't like we were steered the ship way off course. Um, so, you know, I think I think the budget director did a, did a fine job and and predicting revenues and and you know we dealt with it by the rainy day fund. Okay. Fred, what do you think? Well I think that what you know has been said, and I think the question is really good on what <clears throat> Representative uh, Nate has said is is, is sound. Um, the the percentage we were off was by more than one percent. It was a significant double uh, single digit percentage. But regardless of that, um, uh, Part of the difficulty it is, even though it seems simple to roll it back and, and, and do zero-based budgeting and all that business, part of the problem is we have a 90-day session. We're limited by the Constitution. And you're looking deep into agency budgets and trying to figure out, you know, what's done there and what's necessary there and unnecessary there. And, and frankly, you know, you don't get as much help as you might like to um, – to deal with that agency. I mean, they may hold back data. I mean, I, the DPHHS, uh, you ask them questions and they'll answer them, and, and you just know they're not being up front with you to be nice about it. The Montana and, and DPHHS or the federal? The, the Montana. Why, why uh, would that be, do you think? Because they don't want us to know what the answers to our questions are. Really? And, prob- oh. and, and beyond oh. that, they, they yeah, they're not candid with you, they're not up front with you, and and then it's just it's like, well, where do you go if you're not going to be up front with me now on this question? How do I get you to, you know, do I just keep answer asking questions that go nowhere? It's very difficult. Now, Nate seems and, to and, disagree with you on that. No, so. I just I, I I would love an example. I just don't know. I haven't had that. Well, experience. go back and, and go into our committee hearings, and when we ask about food stamps, when we ask them about um, the you know the the ability to audit, and and is there any fraud? It's, uh, they they go into this stuff that they they just they are not candid. They do not uh, answer your que- they answer your questions, but that's just basically it. They do not give you what we're looking for as far as um, details and uh, uh, and I I we, we I'd be happy to share that data with you. Um, well, I I, it's I, there. I agree. You know, sometimes Fred, I I sat on committees too where the 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 agency will say we'll get those numbers to you at a later date. Um, and that that does happen all the time, and and I don't know that anybody at DPHHS is you know you know purposely trying to mislead yeah, the that, legislature. That, that, that would be an interesting story. Even if it's misleading oh, well, through negligence, no, though, it makes it no, hard to get it through in ninety on. days, you right? Can, you can put me on record. They purposefully do not address our questions and be forthright with us because they don't want us to know. So that's, I'll just go on record with that. Now, Fred, I've been through too many hearings and too many committees to have that not the case. I mean, it's just too bad, but that's the way it is. Do you think that it's might very change difficult to, now that the head of it isn't the head of DPHHS stepping down or removed? Um, he, he's going to. There's, there's, there will be a new person in charge there. Um, their default deal is they say, well, our computer systems don't track all this data. We can't get it for you. Uh, we, we really, frankly, don't have any idea if that's true or not. Um, that we have auditors in there, and they don't they don't cooperate with them to audit and to look at data. That's where a lot of the whistleblowing is coming from, and saying we've had misappropriation of funds there. And we don't. Uh, when we raise these questions, they they uh, stomp on the whistleblower and fire them and and, and uh, demote them. Good thing that's we have the courts. Part of, I agree with you, Senator. Well, I don't know about the courts, but. I think that we're going to have to look into this deeply in the case as a legislature and, and say what it, what merit is there to these allegations. There is and at least one be... active whistleblower case in the DPHS uh, household. So, and, and we're, we, need, we need to take a break. Uh, as a, but we, you guys are officially rock stars now because all the lines are full, and we eventually will have a T-shirt that says a Talk Back All Star. So <laughs> we're going to come right back with uh, more of Talk Back in a moment. Our guests in studio, Nate McConnell. We've got Fred Thomas on the phone, and we have Josh, Mark, and Eric. All want to visit with you, so we'll be right back. 
Ladies and gentlemen, uh, if only we had video. Wait a minute, we do have video. Well, we could. Uh, we should take, take a, a picture, take a photo. Right? Absolutely. Uh, joining us in studio right now, the latest uh, KGVO uh, Talkback All Star is Nate McConnell and Fred Thomas. Uh, we will be getting that T-shirt to you. And uh, if there's any way you guys could wear it on the floor of the House or Senate and get a, get a photo taken, that would be the coolest thing ever. Nate, I'll make sure we might not do it on the floor, but we'll do that for you. <laughs> I, that's how we we'll, should start the rules committee tomorrow. Just how, how, maybe, much, maybe how much standing in front, of, standing in front of the men's room door or something like that. <laughs> First rule of rules committee rotunda. club is we don't talk about what happened on KGVO. Okay, now we, we got to get to the phones because people have been waiting very, very patiently to visit with you, gentlemen. Josh, you're up first. Hi. Hi. What's up? Well, I've got, I guess, a comment and maybe a couple of questions. Uh, but I deal with state government on a regular basis, and I am always shocked at how lean it is. I walk into state government offices. I see no room for storage and boxes stored in halls. I see people parked in closets. I see furniture that's surplus furniture that the federal government has stopped using. I don't see a lot of room to cut state government unless we are going to do something like, I think one of the other callers suggested, go to zero-based budgeting. And as, as uh, Representative McConnell mentioned, I think quoting Joe Biden, you know, take a look at your budget to see where your values are. So I guess I have two questions. One is, where are your values? And I guess I challenge you, Senator Thomas, you act like it's self-evident that the Highway Patrol can't take a cut. Why not? What does the Highway Patrol do? What Do you have statistics that support the number of officers that need to be out there? What information do we really have about how many patrol officers we need? For all I know, we really do need a cut. So I'm wondering, how do you come to your conclusion that it's apparently so obvious that we need more highway patrol? Uh, And then my other question is, what about the revenue side? I haven't heard anybody say anything about revenue, because when John asks or says, as he did earlier in the show, are we going to give up something we value? I'm telling you right now, we are. This state is lean. So if we don't fund state government, we're going to lose something. And maybe it's we lose support for poor people, which, frankly, Senator Thomas, I'm hearing you disdain the effort to support poor people. But what about education? Because I know that the University of Montana has passed or has been unable to hire professors, their first choice, their second choice, sometimes their third or fourth choice, again and again and again, because they don't have the money. So, and, and somehow we still say, come to the University of Montana and get a great education. And frankly, unless you guys will fund state government, I hope you'll stop telling that lie. Okay, so Josh. we have everything we need. Let's, so, let, let's, so those let's, are my questions. Thanks for your <laughs> call. So, so uh, Senator Thomas, well, you're up first. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah first of all, uh, total mischaracterization uh, to disdain poor people. Uh, the, the question was having to do with priorities. And I will be very clear again and tell you that I'm going to put a priority on funding somebody in a wheelchair, a low-income senior, a blind person, or a woman with children that's single, uh, than somebody that can go out and is able-bodied, no kids, and, and make a living. So if that's disparaging low-income people, then you got me. Um, so as you, as you work through and legitimately make prioritizations on all this stuff, you got to make issue. You got to deal with those things, and you got to make decisions on based on those things. Highway patrol. I mean, we're talking about major cut there. Uh, we're not talking about adding on to the highway patrol. We're at, we're talking about sustaining what we have. No one has ever said that that we have way too many. Maybe the governor thinks that. Maybe that's his position. I don't know. I think he's probably said this is where we need to take a look and make cuts. I think a lot of us are going to look at the highway patrol and say, no, we don't. We don't buy that there. Does it mean that they can't take a cut? No. Everybody's going to take a cut of some sort. The question is how much and where. And so your observation of state government, it could be, I don't know, exactly dead on. I don't know that everybody's going to see it the same way that you see it when you walk through wherever you have, and it's just austere. I don't know that is the case. I don't have the uh, statistics that the caller was asking for, but I will tell you this. Um, we had, in just the past two weeks, uh, four chases involving uh, Highway Patrol County police, all of which involved methamphetamine. Mm-hmm. Most of that methamphetamine is being trafficked through I-90, uh, which is under the auspices of the Highway Patrol. 
And I know it's uh, there was uh, 40 pounds or so sold over in the Butte Anaconda area. I mean, <clears throat> if you're going to have an effective combat on the spread of methamphetamine in Montana, it seems to me highway patrol is going to be a crucial part of that plan. And again, there, there, there's a perfect example of what John was talking about. Let's look at what they're actually doing. And, yeah. and, and if, it, if it's effective, then let's keep it up. I, th- I think, <clears throat> excuse me, that also brings up an important uh, area that, that we're going to address in this upcoming session, and that is criminal justice reform. Um, we, Senator Cynthia Walken here in Missoula and, and Representative Kim Dudick, um, Ellie Smith and others have, have worked very hard to present to the legislature through their um, interim committees um, some reforms that are going to be vital to addressing the issues that John brought up. Um, the, the meth problem, you know, you talk to any district court judge here in Missoula, the meth problem is a major problem. It affects okay. criminal dockets. It, it affects the DN, dependent neglect dockets. And and the, whole, the whole health the whole health situation. And it costs a lot of money. Right. And, and we've got to, you know, I think one way to address these concerns is to invest in things like, you know, criminal justice reform. We've got to get people into treatment. We've got to use all the tools available in the tool chest to address this problem. And I, frankly, you know, this brings up for me an important issue, and that is early education. I mean, if the, this, this sounds disjointed, but, but follow this. The earlier you get people into a classroom, learning, socializing with each other, understanding how to read and write, the lower the cost in the long run for things like the criminal justice system, for dependent neglect. Things like that. So, an investment in early education, a dollar is worth up to up to. I've seen a st- statistic that says seventeen dollars um, later on. Okay. If you can get kids into the system and being productive citizens, you win. Okay, we're going to come right back. Seven two one twelve ninety. I know Fred wants to comment on that. So does Mark and Eric. We also have Brad Sheeta on the phone. That's right. Hey, uh, so. Yeah, and, it's going to be a busy day. All right, and by the way, that uh, that is very becoming to have that T-shirt on. I mean, it's, I, I think it's going to be the coming look in the legislature. All the Democrats are going to want those T-shirts. <laughs> He's so dashing. The, the <laughs> rallying cry for the Democratic, the fight in forty-one. <laughs> And we are back having way too much fun. We just got a call from the fun police saying, knock it off. Let's be serious here. 721-1290 is our number, 1-800-568-5309. Uh, joining us in the mix now, uh, for, uh, we uh, have said goodbye to uh, to Fred Thomas with a promise that we're going to get him a T-shirt. And uh, Brad Sheeta is now joining us on the phone. Good morning, Brad. Good morning, Peter and John and Nate. How are you? We are great. Fantastic. Even Nate is shaking his head. Now, now, Nate, are you a, what? Do you have a role in party leadership? I am. Uh, I was elected uh, one of the whips in the Democrats. So you guys are both whips, because it, uh, I believe Brad is also a whip, right? Correct. I am. So, um, so you're whipping to different directions. Do you guys have? Do you have whip wars? I mean, how does that? <laughs> is it kind of like a locker room thing? <laughs> If Brad gets a T-shirt, then we'll talk about it. No, no, no. This, this is a family program. Yeah, we, can get these, <laughs> we can roll up the T-shirts, get them a little wet. They'd be great for that, I'm sure. Cheetah's a okay. big guy, man. I'm not I'm not getting into that one. <laughs> yeah, but he's a big old guy, man. Well, well now, Brad, let, let's let's get you involved in, in the actual conversation here. We've been talking, we're talking about that. Have you been following about the budget and the, the various things we've been talking about? Yes, I have. So, so do you have any, what would you like to contribute before we get back to our callers? Well, there's a number of things that I think are going on. First of all, the state does not have the revenue that uh, uh, a lot of the budget increases are calling for. So it's going to be very, very difficult to pass uh, a lot of measures. They're going to have additional spending on them. I know that uh, Governor Bullock's budget calls for about an $8 million reduction in 2018 and then a $44 million increase in 2019, which is kind of betting on the cop. I don't believe that we're going to see the revenues come back as quickly. Second thing is that uh, I heard a couple of comments, uh, you know, that the, the fire suppression fund is one that they're trying to to raid for about twenty five million dollars, and that money needs to be kept in that fund. I mean, it's you know to, to take money out of a fund that that has a little bit of extra to spend it where you've uh, overspent to me is poor fiscal management. You know, above the budget that the uh, the house uh, provided uh, in twenty thirteen and twenty fifteen 
Governor Bullock has increased spending $800 million. So I want to make that point clear. It's $800 million more than the budgets that were passed initially out of the House in 2015 and 2013 and 2015. So to go in and take money out now to, to cover an excess of spending, I think, is, is wrongful and, and, and inappropriate. Uh, the other comment had to do, I, I heard uh, Representative McConnell's uh, comment about early education. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm a big proponent of education. I spent 12 years in that field. But when you see a program that supposedly uh, has the benefit evaporate by the third grade, why would you spend millions of dollars to get no more benefit after uh, a young person hits the age of nine? That That's really the, the crux to me. I want to see everybody have a chance to succeed. But if we're, what we're giving them is sort of a, a temporary success level, and then after uh, the third grade, the difference between those who start early and those who don't uh, evaporates, there's no benefit in my mind. And we can take a look at... Uh, you know, at, at federal programs like Head Start that have never proven to be effective at educating uh, individuals long term uh, as, a, as a reason uh, to, to really seriously uh, investigate whether we spend extra dollars in that area or not. I say we just expand KGVO, make it accessible. It's free, you know, <laughs> public service, you know, you're learning. Just pipe it in. I you have to no give the kids a pair of headphones. My no six-year-old and three-year-old would dig this, I'm sure. <laughs> well, no prior education, that's for sure. We'll right, include more dinosaurs and pirates let's, in upcoming episodes. Let's, uh, let's get Mark on the line uh, and get serious here. Mark, you are on with our guests. We have, uh, we have uh, Nate McConnell and Brad Sheeta. What's on your mind? Okay, it's uh, today's Missoulian in the editorial section. It says, don't pass the cuts to the highway patrol. And the person who sent it in was Pat Ernest of Hamilton. And they brought up a good point is the tax, state tax on gas has been 27 cents since 1994. Since we're doing really good with, uh, you know, every year, raises getting more and more visitors. So why not raise the state tax to pay for those cuts in the highway patrol? Okay. Yes. Thanks. Thanks for the call. So, gentlemen, do you want to comment on that? Is, that? is that a good trade off or what? He wants to raise the state raise, gas raise the tax. gas tax too the, and he's right the gas tax hasn't gone up in in several years um and i think you know it's ideas like that mark that that are going to help um help us get things done in the upcoming session i think i think that's a that's a great point i think a gas tax um we need to look at that very seriously um and if it you know you can't have a one to one um you can't have you know we're going to raise a gas tax x amount and then that will go to MHP, um, I will let me let me put a quick plug into Montana Highway Patrol. Um, I I've been friendly with those guys for since the start of my political career, and even before. Um, there's a there's a trooper here in town named Phil Smart. Um, his team he scored a goal on my hockey team just the other day, <laughs> and uh, I'm still a little disappointed, but I still consider him a friend. All right, well we're we're up against our final break. It's only a 60 second break, so Brad, I'm going to have you comment on that when we come back. Eric and Candy, we're going to try to get you guys on. We have eight minutes left in the show. Let's make the most of it. We'll be right back. Okay, we are back on Talkback. Seven two one twelve ninety is our number. So I wanted to give uh, give Brad a chance to respond to what the gentleman said about uh, gas tax and and the highway patrol. What do you think? Well, I think it's interesting that uh, the the responsibility of the state government first and foremost is protecting its citizens. Yet the first thing that the governor is talking about is cutting highway patrolmen. Uh, you know, the gas tax has stayed at a, at a certain level because it probably was effective at that level. Does it need to be changed? I don't know. We can investigate that. But I think we have we have bigger problems in terms of waste, fraud, and abuse that would more than compensate for the extra dollars that the highway patrol needs to have, you know, boots on the ground and, and rubber on the road to take care of the citizens. And I think that there are areas like, let's say, for example, um, you know, uh, the, the increase in uh, or the recommended in, increase in early edge. That money, if it, it was available, why not put it into something that is a high priority for the state and that is protecting the citizens? And I think that we need to prioritize what the state's function is because we go down all kinds of rabbit trails and we spend, you know, well, it, 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 here's a definition of, of uh, status. It's spending money you don't have on things you don't need to uh, influence or impress people you don't like. And I think what we have to do is essentially look at what the highest priorities are and expend our revenues wisely in those areas. Now, right. Brad, before you got on, we had a caller say that uh, the government runs on a shoestring, that everything is pretty efficient, and um, you come out saying there's a bunch of waste, fraud, and abuse. Like, Where do you see this? Where's the, 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 the glaring light of waste, fraud, and abuse to you? 
Well, there, there's a couple of areas. First of all, the, the waste could be in $800 million being expended over the last two biennia. Uh, the increases above the budget that the governor has worked with uh, some of the softer Republicans and members of the Democrat Party to to uh, to pass beyond the, uh, uh, the the budget that was established by the House of Representatives. And we've got problems in DPHS, DPHHS right now where there's uh, uh, the potential of having individuals receiving benefits that don't uh, deserve to have them. So that we we can look in all departments and find areas where money is being uh, expended poorly, and we can look at departments where, where money is perhaps not being uh, uh, or is being allocated in excess of what is needed. Okay, well, we've got to get a couple more callers in here. Eric, you've been waiting the longest. Go ahead. Yes, I, the fellow who was just talking... Um, it was Brad Sheeta. Yeah, it was Brad Sheeta. He said something interesting that goes along with uh, the questions that I had, that uh, he said that their responsibility is to protect the citizens, and, and I would disagree with that. The role of government, according to our Declaration of Independence, at least, is to protect rights. And they are there to protect my rights, so they should get out of the way and let me do my own bidding and make sure that nobody hinders that. And, and I, would, I have some free advice. And, and I won't charge you for this, and I'm not. I'm not going to send a bill. Thanks for being so gracious. It, yeah, yes, it's no problem at all. A, a T-shirt um, would be appreciated. <laughs> yeah. Now this is free. Here we go. Um, how about if government steps out of the way and lets me take care of myself and my children, and then you will be able to balance your budget because you're not going to consider taking care of me from cradle to grave. You'll simply protect my rights. Okay, Eric. Thanks. Thanks. Appreciate the call. All right, so uh, then Candy's up next. Hi, Candy. What's on your mind? Yes, I just want to vouch for uh, Fred and Brad's uh, assessment of DPHHS. Uh, I uh, lobbied between 2002 and 2007, in Helena and um, about DPHHS, especially Child Protective Services, and I, fi- I found that they were not forthcoming at all with their statistics and their real numbers, and I think they're one of the most fraudulent um, parts of the uh, legislature, and, now, we're running really short on time. Okay. Do you have a question? And I have to recognize Eric's statements uh, about our rights okay. and our right. rights as parents to guide our children. And I think that, a, that investigations need to be made deeply in okay. DPHHS. Right. Thank you Thank for you. your call. Appreciate that. Okay. We only have a few minutes left. Two minutes. Uh, so real quick, just kind of sound off, uh, give us a little bit of perspective of where we're headed now Nate, as we you, head into you the first. legislative session. Go ahead, Nate. Well, I'm, I'm very encouraged and op- optimistic about um, the the where we started in 2015. I think we have um, really good um, opportunities to to continue the economic growth that Governor Bullock has, has inspired in our state. Um, we've done a great job in, in uh, setting aside a rainy day fund, um, and I think we're uh, – we're, we're headed in the right direction. Okay. So, uh, Brad, we got a minute. Go ahead. Well, I, I don't see economic growth when we see uh, uh, revenues decreasing significantly. And, and I had asked that question of uh, Dan Villa, what happens if oil revenues go down? And there was practically no uh, contingency made for that. And as far as the, um, uh, the, the expenditures that we're making, I, th- I think we need to take a look again at uh, – at where uh, monies need to be expended, and to, to answer the, the call that Eric had, you know, when I said you know we need to protect citizens, we're talking about citizens' rights. It's up to each one of us to have responsibility for our actions. It's not a collective uh, uh, response; it's an individual response. And we, as Montana citizens, need to be given the latitude by uh, um, the government to to live our own lives and, and to be responsible for the good choices and the bad choices. Yeah, now, g- gentlemen, real quick, when does the session start and end? I know it's ninety days, right? It's uh, well, we're we're slated to start first day January second, and um, one estimate I saw, Brad might have seen another one, but April twenty eighth was a date that I saw as well. 
Yeah, either the 26th or 28th. Yeah. That's correct. Well, here at Talkback, we have to collectively respond by saying thank you to both, uh, well, and also to Fred, who's not with us anymore, but Nate McConnell, Brad Sheeta, Fred Thomas for coming on the air. It's a really great sign in Montana's uh, political health that the politicians are willing to come on and talk to the public. And, and, and I'd like to ask both of you, and, and Fred as well, that while the legislation is ongoing, uh, if you would allow us to contact you and talk about things as the, as the sessions are going, would that be okay with you guys? You, you guys can call me anytime. Absolutely. And, and I'm, you know, I, I'm glad that you brought Nate on because I think Nate is a voice of reason that uh, – uh, that the Democrats, you know, kind of have been hiding, and I'm glad that uh, you gave him exposure. <laughs> He's, you can know him now. He's got the T-shirt. Hey, we're out of time. Thanks for joining us, everybody. Have a great day, and stay warm out there.